Hello, everybody, and welcome to Advanced Cooling Technologies November webinar. We'll be covering system level thermal solutions for military grade technologies. Our speakers today are Matt Keller and Devin Pellicone. Matt is the general manager of our York, Pennsylvania location, where he oversees design, production, and service operations. Armed with over 17 years of engineering experience, Matt provides invaluable expertise in ensuring ACT's customers get the best thermal solutions and technical service possible. Devin is the lead engineer of ACT's industrial products group at our Lancaster, Pennsylvania location. He has over 10 years of experience designing and building both passive and active two-phase cooling systems for a wide range of applications, including high-performance computing and power electronics cooling. Before we get started, I want to let everyone know that there will be a live question and answer portion at the conclusion of today's presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to submit them through the present, throughout the presentation by using the question function on the dashboard. Matt and Devin will be, will be answering as many as time allows. We'll follow up with an email for anyone whose questions are not answered live. With all that said, I'll turn things over to our speakers. Thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. I'll tell you a little bit about advanced cooling technologies. We are a thermal management company located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania as our headquarters, and we also have a branch in York, Pennsylvania. We were founded in 2003, and we now have over 200 employees at both locations. We have approximately 140,000 um, square feet of facility space and growing every year, and we have an ISO 9001 and AS9100 quality management system. We've won a number of awards through the Military and Aerospace uh, Product Innovation Awards for the different technologies we've developed over the years. We also work exclusively, um, work extensively in the uh, Small Business Innovation Research Grant. So we've won a number of Tibbetts Awards for that work. And we have numerous uh, patents and scientific publications uh, related to thermal management technologies. Today, we're going to be talking to you about some of our system level cooling technologies, uh, particularly environmental control units or ECUs, glycol coolers and chillers, um, some of our pump two phase or PTP uh, cooling systems, as well as phase change materials, PCM. And we'll end with a little bit of discussion about some of our electronic systems, system controls, um, and packaging capabilities. And then a little bit more about our testing and extra capabilities at the end. And like Kevin mentioned, we'll be ending with some question and answer session to answer any questions you may have. I'll turn it over to Matt Keller to start things off. Thanks, Thanks Evan. Evan. When we talk about system level thermal solutions, we're referring to equipment and accessories utilized to reject the heat generated by system components to the exterior environment. That's usually the ambient condition. Ambient design conditions can be anywhere from negative 50 to 140 Fahrenheit, um, and zero to 10,000 feet elevations for terrestrial systems. In some cases, there may be a chill water infrastructure, uh, which would be the exterior environment we reject, would reject heat to, for example, shipboard chill water or a facility chill water system. So the first thing we need to understand is the design criteria. What are the heat sources? Uh, electronics are gonna be a big one in pretty much every system these days and they're gonna be sensible heat. Uh, that may be a very continuous load or it could be transient in the case of directed energy systems. Uh, occupants may be uh, present in the system and they uh, provide both sensible and latent heat loads that need to be addressed. Uh, the envelope of the system uh, allows conduction from outside temperatures to inside, as well as uh, additional thermal loads that come through due to solar radiation on the exterior skin of a system. Outdoor air may also be a load in the system if we're going to be providing fresh air for pressurization uh, and making sure any leaks in the system leak out, uh, as well as ventilation uh, for the occupants. Once we know what um, the loads in the system are, we also have to understand what we're trying to maintain in the system. So what's, what are the acceptable conditions? Um, for electronics, that's usually an entering air temperature to the electronics. Um, with occupants, it's more of a uh, average space temperature that's being controlled, um, 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit is kind of a reasonable range for that. Relative humidity below 60% is also usually required 
Um, traditionally, we don't get into adding humidity because of the logistical issues of uh, providing a water source and maintaining um, a water source to keep the humidity levels up. So one of the solutions we offer are environmental control units. Uh, an ECU, as we call them, um, is basically an air conditioner built for military environments. They provide conditioned air to an enclosed space. Uh, they can be mounted uh, to hard wall shelters or connected to soft wall shelters or hard wall shelters uh, via flex flexible ducts. So you see some photos here. Um, there's a five ton ECU on the back of a trailer um, behind a Humvee. Uh, we've got systems there in the middle. Um, that's again a five ton, possibly an eight ton, hooked up to a soft wall shelter. Um, there's a radar hub. A cooling unit in the upper right, as well as a dual vertical system um, that's hard mounted to a, a hard wall shelter. Design considerations for ECUs. Um, actually, let me go back. I think we skipped. Okay. Uh, additionally, uh, ECUs are a good way to introduce uh, outdoor air to a system. That outdoor air can be pulled in and mixed with the return air, uh, so it can be conditioned prior to being introduced to the space. Uh, also, we can do 100% outdoor air uh, in the case of flight line cooling. Uh, so the picture at the bottom left shows 100% outdoor air unit that maintains temperature of electronics while sitting on the tarmac, uh, which is the systems on board that UAV aren't suitable to maintain temperatures when you're sitting at up to 140, 160 degree F conditions. ECU design considerations. Um, air systems are a great for going redundant system, um, either if that's for additional capacity, uh, part load condition kind of capacity, or complete redundancy. Um, with air systems, uh, you can use plenums and ducts, backdraft dampers to kind of manage those connections. Um, and redundant systems are great for unmanned or mission critical systems. Capacity uh, ratings for ECUs um, is determined by the ambient condition. So if the ambient condition is higher in temperature, that will decrease the capacity, as well as the return air conditions. Uh, so temperature, humidity, airflow rate, basically the more energy you bring back to the unit, the more cooling it can do. So when you, when you think you know what load you need, um, understanding the return conditions, understanding the ambient conditions will affect the rating of that equipment. And when you're evaluating solutions, you really want to understand what the capacity you're being told is is based on. Um, somebody may call something a five ton unit that we would call a, a three ton unit, depending on the rating conditions. Uh, airflow pattern in the space uh, is also very important. Um, these drawings kind of show a couple of different ways that airflow could be managed. On the left, you have short cycling. So you have air coming out of the ceiling, goes right into a return, uh, and the occupant and the loads don't see all of that air. Um, on the other hand, the far right uh, is really how you'd want to do a, a data center or electronics type environment where you're providing cool air to an occupied space that's then available for the electronics and the heat is then directed directly back to the unit. Because as we just said, the hotter the air to the unit, the more capacity you get out of that unit. So um, the way a unit's connected to a space, the way the air is moved through the space is critical in, in making sure that the defined requirements um, are actually you know, provided to the equipment, the equipment can actually meet the design intent. Another solution uh, that we have experience with are glycol coolers and chillers. Uh, glycol coolers, uh, we refer to here as liquid to air systems, um, basically provide cooling liquid um, at some temperature above ambient. So these are a coil, a fan, a pump, uh, and basically a radiator where we can provide electronics with a uh, a cooler than you know they're we're providing liquid cool enough to pull the heat away from them and keep them happy but we're not providing coolant that's below the ambient temperatures uh, alternatively we can do chillers chillers provide cooling liquid at a fixed supply temperature so we can provide let's say 45 degree uh, fahrenheit uh, glycol even when ambient temperatures are much higher than that um, so that is uh, good for electronics to require low ambient temperature cooling, as well as fixed temperature cooling. Um, so there may be something that's calibrated 
uh, needs to have a constant uh, temperature. Uh, design considerations for glycol coolers and chillers. Um, you know, when you when you go to a glycol system, you have to make sure that the components in the system are designed for that, right? So you need heat sinks that accept glycol, electronic equipment designed for um, a chilled fluid. Uh, piping and fittings that don't leak are obviously important. Um, if a system's modular, uh, quick disconnects are needed so that you can disconnect um, system components either for maintenance um, or replacement or if you're going to uh, strike a system for relocation. Weight uh, also needs to be considered when you're adding uh, fluid. Uh, you know, an air system, obviously, there's no additional weight penalty to the volume of the duct system. Uh, but with a glycol system, any, any storage, any piping uh, would be filled with glycol and therefore that weight would be a consideration. Uh, in addition, glycol storage tanks or PCMs, phase change materials, can be used for thermal storage. This makes a lot of sense when you have a system that doesn't have a continuous load. Uh, you can downsize the system to deal with uh, the average load and use the storage volume to address intermittent loads. Uh, this is great when you're looking at directed energy weapons where the peak load may only be present for a few minutes out of an hour. Um, Devin will tell you a little bit about a previous application like this. Thanks, Matt. This is a uh, case study for a direct energy weapon uh, combined vapor compression and chiller system. So this is using the phase change material. So this is the solid to liquid energy storage mechanisms, this would be latent energy storage as compared to using a sensible, which would be just a giant liquid tank. Um, this is for a direct energy weapon mounted on the back of a, a Humvee as seen in the uh, bottom left there. And really what we're showing is how tightly packaged a system like this can be. If you needed to size the vapor compression system for the peak load of the laser in this particular application, the entire system would have been um, twice this size. So we were able to significantly reduce the size of the vapor compression system by coupling it with a energy storage media like PCM and then also including the chiller system inside of this box. Um, this entire package you can see mounted on the uh, left hand side of the Humvee here includes all the pumps, all the fans, all the electronics, all the vapor compression components all of the sun within one package. So it makes a very complete uh, thermal management solution for highly transient uh, pulsed energy loads. Next, we're going to switch gears a little bit here and talk about a different type of cooling technology. This is similar to uh, what Matt was describing as our glycol coolers, except this is what we call pump two phase cooling. So it's an above ambient liquid cooling solution, but in this case, we're allowing the working fluid to boil or change from liquid to vapor as it flows across the heated components. So it includes a pump, it includes a condenser, an evaporator, and a reservoir, a lot of the same components that a glycol system would have, but the working fluids are typically uh, refrigerants or dielectric fluids that boil at a relatively low temperature and pressure. They are hermetically sealed systems, so we can allow that boiling temperature to fluctuate depending on what pressure we impart on the system, which is really a function of how we cool the system. So they can be paired with some of the chiller solutions that Matt was mentioning earlier so that we can do below ambient cooling, but the system by itself is not capable of doing any refrigeration. We really need that refrigeration cycle uh, coupled to the condenser in order to get below ambient conditions. So some of the benefits of two-phase over a glycol chiller, most of them revolve around um, energy efficiency. So because we're using the latent heat of the working fluid instead of the sensible heat, like we would in glycol chillers or coolers, uh, we're able to use a significantly lower flow rate of the fluid, orders of magnitude lower, in fact. And so that allows us to really shrink down the pump um, that's required for the system for packaging reasons. It allows us to spin the pump at lower speeds, and it allows um, the system to run with lower energy consumption. So that's a big benefit. Another benefit is that because, again, we're changing phases, this all happens at a constant temperature. As you boil the fluid and move from a subcooled liquid to a saturated liquid and eventually vapor, that all happens along a constant temperature line. And so as you're flowing across the evaporator, the components mounted to that evaporator see a constant temperature, which is not the case in a glycol cooler where the fluid's heating up as it's flowing from one side to the other. So if you have multiple components all mounted to the same evaporator, they can all be with maintained um, within about five degrees C of each other, 
And then we can maintain 10 degrees C uh, temperature difference across the entire loop. So highly energy efficient uh, method of cooling. There's a lot of considerations that are different from a glycol system or a sensible cooling system to be discussed when talking about pump tube phase. The first is the uh, heat absorption devices. We call them evaporators because we're changing phase. And these are very similar to the evaporators you may see in a chiller or a vapor compression system. They could be conduction based, meaning you mount your heat generating components directly to those parts, um, or they could be air to refrigerant heat exchangers, much like an evaporator coil would be in a standard air conditioning system. Or it could be some combination of those. And there can be many different evaporators all within a given system. One challenge that comes up with two phase cooling when you have multiple parallel evaporators, like we're showing in the bottom right image here is that you have some flow balancing uh, issues to deal with. If you have one evaporator that's dissipating more energy than the other, then the fluid will boil more in that evaporator compared to others. It'll create more pressure drop. And then you have this sort of unbalanced pressure balance in your manifold that you need to deal with. The way we deal with that is we add flow restrictors to the system so that we can run as many parallel evaporators as necessary, all at different loads or no load at all, and be able to provide constant flow rate to all of them. Another consideration that's unique to two-phase cooling is refrigerant or working fluid selection. In a pump two-phase system, it's a little counterintuitive, but the pressure drop across the loop actually um, results in a thermal resistance change. As we drive around the loop, the pressure decreases, and then the temperature of that fluid also decreases. And so that reduces the amount of temperature gradient we have to get that energy out of the fluid and into the air. So that combats the, uh, the thermal resistance of the system, requires us to have bigger condensers, more airflow, things like that. So what we're really trying to do is minimize the pressure gradients around our loop in a two-phase system. In the top right, we're showing an example comparing R134A to R245FA. They're two different vapor pressure uh, refrigerants that could be used in a pump two-phase system. R134A is significantly higher in vapor pressure. So at 50 degrees C operating point, the resulting pressure drop of 10 PSI around a loop only has a one or two degree C temperature impact. But if we were using a fluid like R245 FA at that same temperature, a 10 PSI pressure difference across an evaporator could have up to an eight or nine degree C impact on our system performance. So picking the right working fluid for the right application um, in the right conditions is really critical. And it's something we take a lot of care with when we're designing these pump two phase systems. Another uh, instance that we need to keep uh, in mind with these systems is that the refrigerants are um, ozone depleting. A lot of them, there are new low global warming potential replacements for a lot of fluids. We're showing some of them here. If that is of concern for your system, we have a number of fluids in our repertoire that um, have either zero or very low global warming potential that we could use. The last note is uh, related to pumps, which comes up a lot when we're talking about pump two phase systems. Uh, refrigerants tend to be very low viscosity fluids, and we're operating very close to the saturation point of those fluids. So pump cavitation and pump performance is a real concern. We try to select pumps that have very minimal uh, net positive suction head, NPSH, and we're usually using pumps that have positive displacement to make sure that they can accommodate low viscosity fluids. It's always a consideration to make sure we're getting the right subcooling in the loop, so pump two phase systems really are a system level design. You can't design one component without consideration for the rest. Some applications of uh, pump two phase, a lot of them are electronics related. What we're showing uh, in the larger image on the right is actually what we would call a coolant distribution unit or CDU for a very large data center application. This is a 200 plus kilowatt um, condensing unit. And in this case, it happens to be a liquid cooled condenser. So we're using facility water or whatever water source is available, possibly from a chiller to cool the refrigerant down to the saturation temperature that we want to send off to the servers to do our cooling. Right below the condenser, which is that uh, large orange rectangle at the top, is a reservoir. Because we're changing phases from liquid to vapor, there's a volume change that needs to be accommodated, and so we need some volume in the system to account for that difference in density. And then all the way at the bottom are our pumps. They tend to be N plus one redundant, depending on the system we're working on. Uh, positive displacement pumps distributing that liquid to all of the many servers um, that this system serviced. In this case, I believe it was servicing up to 40 individual server blades, all from one central pumping. So that's what I mean when I say we can handle multiple parallel evaporators as long as it's designed appropriately. Some other applications on the bottom there um, 
are utilizing either air or liquid as their condenser. In the middle is a large uh, 30 kilowatt coolant distribution unit with a sort of uh, residential air conditioner style condenser coil that's U-shaped that we're using to dissipate the energy to the ambient air. So these things come in all different shapes and sizes and can be suited for any application. Um, and there's also the ability to combine pumped two-phase with vapor compression because they're often using the same refrigerants to be able to do some sort of uh, hybrid energy efficiency refrigeration cycle. So you can use eco mode and pump the refrigerant to the evaporator when the ambient conditions allow for it. And when the ambient gets too hot, you turn your compressor on to be able to do subambient cooling to keep your system at optimal temperature all year round. We talked about phase change materials a little bit in the direct energy weapon application, but there's other applications for this. Um, they can be used to supplement air or liquid systems um, as well as electronics. They're really, we would consider these thermal batteries or thermal capacitors. So any system that has a transient thermal load can benefit from having a phase change material to damp out the peaks and valleys of that load. Um, in a glycol system, the PCM, like we talked about, can help reduce the swap of the system to damp out those pulse loads and minimize the size of uh, the rest of your components. A key thing when utilizing phase change materials is that they're often fairly poor thermal conductors on their own. And so they require quite an infrastructure of thermal pads in order to distribute the heat into them evenly and utilize all of the material. We're showing an example of something like that in the bottom left, where we're using sort of a folded thin structure in order to distribute the heat evenly throughout all of the phase change materials so that you're really utilizing all that extra mass you're adding to the system. If you don't have something like this in place, then you wind up with clumps of solid and liquid material in there, and you're really not getting the weight optimization that you're looking for. So phase change materials come in all um, different temperature ranges. Uh, the big benefit here is that, again, this solid to liquid phase transition happens at a constant temperature. And so while you're absorbing all of that en energy of your transient load, you're not increasing the system's temperature or component's temperature. We're showing that schematically on the plot on the right here. You increase in temperature all the way up to the melt point of that material, and then you flatline while you absorb all of the latent heat. And then once you have melted all of the material, the temperature rises again, and you're back to sensible heating now in liquid phase instead of solid phase. But that melt zone is really where a lot of the energy is absorbed and where you get the biggest bang for your buck out of these materials. Schematically at the bottom, we're showing another example of this uh, sort of pulsed energy system where the peak load is shown by the red bars. And this is the energy that would need to be dissipated by a vapor compression system or an equivalent chiller if you didn't have some sort of uh, thermal capacitor in the system. The blue lines is showing the damped out load. And you can see very clearly that having a load-shaped thermal uh, profile reduces significantly the load on the overall system. And so all those components get smaller, they get more energy efficient, and your system becomes um, more optimized. The last thing to note about phase change materials here is that they come in almost every degree C increment from negative 60 degrees C up to positive 400 um, and almost everything in between. Those are not all the same type of material, so materials compatibility is a real consideration here, um, but there's lots of options for, for how you implement these materials into your system. So I'll hand it back to Matt to talk a little about our controls and electronics capabilities. Um, so when we put together a controls package, one of the things we have to start with is what are we trying to control? Um, for uh, air systems, if you're doing an occupied space, you might do return air, uh, might kind of function like uh, a house residential style system where uh, you're basically looking at the air coming back and once it gets too warm, you, you start to cool. Once you get too cold, you turn it off. So you can cycle on and off. We also have modulating systems, either through the use of a digital compressor or an EPR valve, um, and that gives you uh, tighter temperature control. Um, supply air or supply glycol control can be used for electronics. Uh, and if there you really do want to have a, a managed flow path. Um, so if you know that the air you deliver to the space or the liquid you deliver to the system will go to directly to the loads, that, that temperature can be increased, uh, which optimizes performance of the system. Um, when you have poor distribution, that's when you have to supply colder air because it'll get mixed 
before the electronics actually see it. Um, sometimes there's a critical location in the system, so we might have a, a temp sensor directly at a piece of equipment, uh, and you might control the whole system just to keep that one piece of equipment happy. Humidity, again, can be a control point. Uh, and we may use hot gas reheat or electric reheat to overcool the air and reheat the air to wring out moisture. Uh, power draw and inrush events are also something to consider with the control strategy. Uh, if, um, if there's not VFDs in the system, uh, then you really don't want to bring on a big load at a, at a time when uh, a brownout to the power system could uh, cause issues to other system components. So we have systems that will operate continuous compressor, um, and that's not energy efficient, but that is good to keep the power system stable uh, if you're doing some sort of scanning or radar uh, activity where you can't deal with uh, reduced voltage. Um, Fan and pump speed modulation also may be used in the system. Um, we do have systems that will, that will ramp down the airflow um, to the shelter when the cooling load is not at its greatest. A lot of these shelters are not very large. They pack a lot of uh, cooling load into a small space, and so it can almost be a wind tunnel in there at times. So anytime you're not in that worst case condition to back off airflow does make the interior environment uh, a little nicer. Um, we do have different types of controls we use here, electromechanical controls, um, di digital, digital temperature um, controls, as well as PLC, where we can basically um, come up with any custom control configuration that's required. Uh, local control interfaces could be as simple as an on-off switch or a red to blue dial uh, to a touch screen that allows you to change set points by tenths of a degree. Uh, remote connectivity is also something that we can provide. Uh, can, we can do Ethernet-based communication, Modbus, SNMP, uh, TCP, uh, IP um, as examples, and use discrete connectors um, and, and have analog signals to report temperature, discrete signals to report um, specific conditions or, or faults. So uh, to summarize kind of our capabilities um, you know we want to be involved in the project as soon as possible uh, we want to help steer the system level design to make sure that all the components can be optimized um, so really getting involved at the requirements definition stage is ideal um, but we go through the kind of normal military design cycle with uh, PDR and CDR uh, CDR phase critical design phase uh, will work on mechanical packaging for the environmental requirements. We're very familiar with mill standard 810 testing um, for shock and vibe, um, uh, all kinds of environmentals, blowing uh, sand and dust, uh, snow, wind, salt fog. Um, we've gone through lots of EMI testing. That really is something that is unique every time we do a design. Uh, and we always recommend if there's strict EMI RFI requirements that we do those uh, by test. Uh, we'll also do reliability analyses at the CDR phase. Uh, then, you know, we will pr uh, procure the materials based on any flowed down requirements uh, and get into manufacturing. We do test 100% of the equipment we make uh, for thermal performance at increased ambience. Uh, we do that in-house uh, and we will go outside uh, for qualification type testing um, based on the environmental requirements. System support uh, is then offered uh, with O&M manuals, spare parts and replacement procedures, um, and we deal with component obsolescence as we help to support these systems for up to 15 years, 20 years. Um, we offer training, service and support, and repair and reset. Uh, I hope everyone's, I hope been, asking everyone's been asking questions as questions they've, as been, they've going been going here, um, um, but I think we have, we have a poll that we're ready, ready to introduce. introduce. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Matt. We're going to take a couple minutes here to, uh, to send out a poll survey here. You'll see it pop up on your screen. Please feel free to answer that. And if you have any questions uh, relating to our talk or really anything, um, input them into the chat box here, and Matt and I will be answering your questions live in a couple minutes here.
Thank you, Matt and Devin, for sharing this information, and thank you to everybody who participated in our poll. At this time, we're going to transition to the question and answer portion, and thank you again to everybody who submitted questions throughout the, throughout the uh, presentation, and feel free to continue asking questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. So our first question here, uh, how do you recommend determining the actual electronics loads in the system? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you do want to uh, consult any manufacturer's data first. Uh, they're going to be the experts on their equipment. Uh, but anytime you can run a system and collect power draw, it'll give you a good idea what's happening. Um, you don't want to just add up worst case loads and assume they all happen at once all the time. Um, that's a sure way to oversize your system. Um, and that causes all kinds of problems with control. Um, so we definitely try to guard against that. Yeah, it's also important if it's an electrical cabinet to consider the loads from the ambient. This gets uh, neglected sometimes when we're sizing com components like enclosure coolers and things like that. It's important to consider the, the solar loading on the cabinet, any natural convection loadings if you're in a hot environment. Um, the electrical loads are, are definitely one of the main components, but those things uh, can't be neglected either. So make sure you're considering all of the potential loads like Matt went over in uh, the slides earlier all the loads that could be in your system to make sure you're really getting a complete thermal solution. How do you deal with low thermal conductivity of PCM resulting in a relatively long melting time? Uh, I think I'll you should take that one. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in the, uh, in the talk. So PCM materials, most of them are, are pretty terrible thermal conductors. And so what you're really trying to do is to short circuit the PCM as much as possible thermally. And so that typically requires having some uh, enhanced surface area inside of the PCM material. You want to embed high surface area materials with phase change material, try and minimize the conduction path as much as possible. That'll give you the best result in terms of uh, how much PCM you need in your system and how efficiently uh, it reacts over time. It'll also minimize your, your melt times. If you have to conduct through a poor thermal interface, like a liquid layer of PCM before you get to the solid, that's only going to slow things down and it's really going to increase the temperature gradients in your system. So it's really a system level solution. Uh, some people think that phase change materials are as easy as dumping some wax in a box and that's, um, that's not quite going to get you there. It's really a highly engineered system. So we make sure we take all of that into account. Do you ever work with Sterling cycle coolers? The, the short answer to that is not really. Um, we have done some cryo cores in our research and development uh, group, so Sterling Cycle using uh, cryo cores, but most of our refrigeration systems are the ones Matt was describing where our, they're vapor compression based. Um, really the Sterling cores tend to be more for cryogenic applications and we don't see a lot of those. It's not to say we wouldn't do it, uh, we just haven't done, done a lot of it today. Can you talk more about how uh, cooling data centers um, and how to cool data centers in general? Cool. There's a lot of ways. I'll talk about the liquid cooling. Maybe you can talk about the air cooling. Yeah. Um, so we did mention that pump two phase application, which was for data center cooling. That's kind of the new wave of handling these these really high heat load, high performance computing type of data center applications. And the reason pump two phase is really suitable for that application is that it's capable of absorbing a lot of energy with a small amount of energy input. So it's above ambient cooling solution. So a cooling tower or some ultimate rejection system is needed on the roof of your building. But at the server level, you're really picking up the most amount of energy or heat per unit of energy input into the system using um, pump two phase cooling or some sort of liquid to vapor um, cooling technique. And so when energy efficiency is really the, the name of the game in data centers that that gets you where you need to be at the server level. Um, well, yeah, and I mean, even if you have chill water in the building, um, you know, a lot of people are not going to feel comfortable putting uh, chill water into this the, into the server area. So, uh, heat exchanger to a two phase pumping system. Uh, one of the benefits of that refrigerant is if you have a leak, yeah. it'll it'll leak as a gas. So you're not going to uh, have conductive liquid all over electronics if there is a leak. So I know that uh, pump two phase, even with a chill water system, is still kind of preferred at the load. Um, and like you said, with the continuous or the constant temperature across the heat sink, it really allows for optimized equipment. Um, from an air system side, um, hot aisle, cold aisle might be terminology you're familiar with. And this is really about making sure 
that the cold air from the crack units or whatever the air handler is called in the system uh, is delivered to the inlet of the equipment. Uh, and then the hot aisle would be where the racks um, blow everything out. So, you know, one of the things I've seen in some kind of tactical systems is you have a hodgepodge of equipment. Some have fans in the front pulling in, some have fans in the back pulling in. And so now you, you don't have all the equipment even pulling from the same side. So very quickly, you can have a piece of equipment that gets the heat from another piece of equipment and isn't happy even though you know the air handler attached to the system is, is about adequate capacity. If the air can't get to the uh, electronics, you have trouble. So definitely taking into account uh, the direction of airflow and management of the airflow for the electronics is, is a big thing. And our last product coming back to the energy efficiency part for data centers that we didn't talk about today is uh, a product called a wraparound heat pipe, heat exchanger. And this is actually incorporated directly into the air handlers um, for the crack units. And what it's helping to do is to enhance the dehumidification of the system. So you can do some pre-cooling, some free reheat on the system. Uh, we also have air to air energy exchange products where you're recycling that air through the data center and you tend to be throwing away cold air that's already been conditioned. You can use that energy to pre-cool the hot air from the outside without needing to input any more energy into the system. And so it can improve the overall energy efficiency of your data center, even if you're still using air cooling, um, it could even work with the liquid cooling systems. So that's quite a lot of technologies for, for data center applications. What, what is, is the max power, power that can be removed in two-phase cooling, two cooling from, from an ASIC 10 by 20 millimeter with exposed dye? That's a great question. Um, we have done some ASIC cooling. It's, um, I'll, I won't talk specifically, I guess, to that dye, but uh, we have developed pump two-phase cooling solutions for up to about 300 watts per centimeter squared um, cooling applications. It, it depends a lot on the, the type of application. It depends on what your maximum temperature can be and how exotic we get with the evaporator. We've done some true micro-channel um, cooling evaporators for pump two-phase where we can get even higher heat fluxes. It's a little bit R&D. Um, if the question is referring to immersion cooling, so direct cooling of the junction itself, um, we have a little bit of experience, again, that's more R&D, but you're impinging the refrigerant directly onto your exposed chip, and you can do that because they're dielectric fluids and they won't short out your system. Um, the word of caution there is that surface area tends not to be sufficient when you're doing immersion cooling. You want a lot of surface area to distribute that heat flux to the fluid, or you start to create vapor bubbles very rapidly on your surface, and then it creates this sort of critical heat flux situation where you're impinging liquid onto a vapor bubble and it's not really hitting your heat source. Um, so there's a lot of considerations there. That's a very challenging problem, but we do have experience with very high heat flux um, microchip cooling applications. What is a realistic duty factor for heat load from the equipment power draws? Uh, that, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I know sometimes uh, we like to use like whatever KW is being pulled into the equipment is the KW of heat we have to reject. Obviously, theoretically, that doesn't make sense because some meaningful work is happening. Um, so I, I, we tend to use like an 85% um, as a rule of thumb, um, but really it, it's going to depend on the application of the actual equipment. Oh, it looks like we're out of time. So as a reminder, if we didn't have time to answer your question, we'll be following up with an email. Additionally, if you think of any more questions or if you'd like to schedule a call with our engineering team to discuss thermal management needs for your ongoing projects, you can send an email to solutions at one-act.com. Thank you all again for attending today's webinar, and we hope you'll join us again soon. Have a great day.